a thanksgiving sermon a lecture by colonel robert g ingersoll as printed in the works of robert g ingersoll volume four published nineteen hundred read by michelle fry baton ridge louisiana and now a thanksgiving sermon part one of two many ages ago our fathers were living in dens and caves their bodies their low foreheads were covered with hair they were eating berries roots bark and vermin they were fond of snakes and raw fish they discovered fire and probably by accident learned how to cause it by friction they found how to warm themselves to fight the frost and storm they fashioned clubs and rude weapons of stone with which they killed the larger beasts and now and then each other slowly painfully almost imperceptibly they advanced they crawled and stumbled staggered and struggled toward the light to them the world was unknown on every hand was the mysterious the sinister the hurtful the forests were filled with monsters and the darkness was crowded with ghosts devils and fiendish gods these poor wretches were the slaves of fear the sport of dreams now and then one rose a little above his fellows used his senses the little reason that he had found something new some better way then the people killed him and afterwards knelt with reverence at his grave then another thinker gave his thought was murdered another tomb became sacred another step was taken in advance and so through countless years of ignorance and cruelty of thought and crime of murder and worship of heroism suffering and self-denial the race has reached the heights where now we stand looking back over the long and devious roads that lie between the barbarism of the past and the civilization of today, thinking of the centuries that rolled like waves between these distant shores we can form some idea of what our fathers suffered of the mistakes they made some idea of their ignorance their stupidity and some idea of their sense their goodness their heroism it is a long road from the savage to the scientist from the den to the mansion from leaves to clothes from a flickering rush to the arc light from a hammer of stone to the modern mill a long distance from the pipe of pan to the violin to the orchestra from a floating log to a steamship from a sickle to a reaper from a flail to a threshing machine from a crooked stick to a plow from a spinning wheel to a spinning jenny from a hand loom to a jacquard a jacquard that weaves fair forms and wondrous flowers beyond arachne's utmost dream from a few hieroglyphs on the skins of beasts on the bricks of clay to a printing press to a library a long distance from the messenger travelling on foot to the electric spark from knives and tools of stone to those of steel a long distance from sand to telescopes from echo to the phonograph the phonograph that buries in indented lines and dots the sounds of living speech and then gives back to life the very words and voices of the dead a long way from the trumpet to the telephone the telephone that transports speech as swift as thought and drops the words perfect as minted coins in listening ears a long way from a fallen tree to the suspension bridge from the dried sinews of beasts to the cables of steel from the oar to the propeller from the sling to the rifle from the catapult to the cannon a long distance from revenge to law from the club to the legislature from slavery to freedom from appearance to fact from fear to reason and yet the distance has been travelled by the human race countless obstructions have been overcome numberless enemies have been conquered thousands and thousands of victories have been won for the right and millions have lived laboured and died for their fellow-men for the blessings we enjoy for the happiness that is ours we ought to be grateful our hearts should blossom with thankfulness whom what should we thank 
let us be honest generous should we thank the church christianity has controlled christendom for at least fifteen hundred years during these centuries what have orthodox churches accomplished for the good of man in this life man needs raiment and roof food and fuel he must be protected from heat and cold from snow and storm he must take thought for the morrow in the summer of youth he must prepare for the winter of age he must know something of the causes of disease of the conditions of health if possible he must conquer pain increase happiness and lengthen life he must supply the wants of the body and feed the hunger of the mind what good has the church done has it taught men to cultivate the earth to build homes to weave cloth to cure or prevent disease to build ships to navigate the seas to conquer pain or to lengthen life did christ or any of his apostles add to the sum of useful knowledge did they say one word in favor of any science of any art did they teach their fellow men how to make a living how to overcome the obstructions of nature how to prevent sickness how to protect themselves from pain from famine from misery and rags did they explain any of the phenomena of nature any of the facts that affect the life of man did they say anything in favor of investigation of study of thought did they teach the gospel of self-reliance of industry of honest effort can any farmer mechanic or scientist find in the new testament one useful fact is there anything in the sacred book that can help the geologist the astronomer the biologist the physician the inventor the manufacturer of any useful thing what has the church done from the very first it taught the vanity the worthlessness of all earthly things it taught the wickedness of wealth the blessedness of poverty it taught that the business of this life was to prepare for death it insisted that a certain belief was necessary to ensure salvation and that all who failed to believe or doubted in the least would suffer eternal pain according to the church the natural desires ambitions and passions of man were all wicked and depraved to love god to practice self-denial to overcome desire to despise wealth to hate prosperity to desert wife and children to live on roots and berries to repeat prayers to wear rags to live in filth and drive love from the heart these for centuries were the highest and most perfect virtues and those who practised them were saints the saints did not assist their fellow-men their fellow-men assisted them they did not labour for others they were beggars parasites vermin they were insane they followed the teachings of christ they took no thought for the morrow they mutilated their bodies scarred their flesh and destroyed their minds for the sake of happiness in another world during the journey of life they kept their eyes on the grave they gathered no flowers by the way they walked in the dust of the road avoided the green fields their moans made all the music they wished to hear the babble of brooks the songs of birds the laughter of children were nothing to them pleasure was the child of sin and the happy needed a change of heart they were sinless and miserable but they had faith they were pious and wretched but they were limping towards heaven what has the church done it has denounced pride and luxury all things that adorn and enrich life all the pleasures of sense the ecstasies of love the happiness of the hearth the clasp and kiss of wife and child and the church has done this because it regarded this life as a period of probation a time to prepare to become spiritual to overcome the natural to fix the affections on the invisible to become passionless to subdue the flesh to congeal the blood to fold the wings of fancy to become dead to the world so that when you appeared before god you would be the exact opposite of what he made you what has the church done 
it pretended to have a revelation from god it knew the road to eternal joy the way to death it preached salvation by faith and declared that only orthodox believers could become angels and all doubters would be damned it knew this and so knowing it became the enemy of discussion of investigation of thought why investigate why discuss why think when you know it sought to enslave the world it appealed to force it unsheathed the sword lighted the faggot forged the chain built the dungeon erected the scaffold invented and used the instruments of torture it branded maimed and mutilated it imprisoned and tortured it blinded and burned hanged and crucified and utterly destroyed millions and millions of human beings it touched every nerve of the body produced every pain that can be felt every agony that can be endured and it did all this to preserve what it called the truth to destroy heresy and doubt and to save if possible the souls of a few it was honest it was necessary to prevent the development of the brain to arrest all progress and to do this the church used all its power if men were allowed to think and express their thoughts they would fill their minds and the minds of others with doubts if they were allowed to think they would investigate and then they might contradict the creed dispute the words of priests and defy the church the priests cried to the people it is for us to talk it is for you to hear our duty is to preach and yours is to believe what has the church done there have been thousands of councils and synods thousands and thousands of occasions when the clergy have met and discussed and quarrelled when pope and cardinals bishops and priests have added to or explained their creeds and denied the rights of others what useful truth did they discover what fact did they find did they add to the intellectual wealth of the world did they increase the sum of knowledge i admit that they looked over a number of jewish books and picked out the ones that jehovah wrote did they find the medicinal virtue that dwells in any weed or flower i know that they decided that the holy ghost was not created not begotten but that he proceeded did they teach us the mysteries of the metals and how to purify the ores in furnace flames they shouted great is the mystery of godliness did they show us how to improve our condition in this world they informed us that christ has two natures and two wills did they give us even a hint as to any useful thing they gave us predestination foreordination and just enough free will to go to hell did they discover or show us how to produce anything for food did they produce anything to satisfy the hunger of man instead of this they discovered that a peasant girl who lived in palestine was the mother of god this they proved by a book and to make the book evidence they called it inspired did they tell us anything about chemistry how to combine and separate substances how to subtract the hurtful how to produce the useful they told us that bread by making certain motions and mumbling certain prayers could be changed into the flesh of god and that in the same way wine could be changed to his blood and this notwithstanding the fact that god never had any flesh or blood but has always been a spirit without body parts or passions what has the church done it gave us the history of the world of the stars and the beginning of all things it taught the geology of moses the astronomy of joshua and elijah it taught the fall of man and the atonement proved that a jewish peasant was god established the existence of hell purgatory and heaven it pretended to have a revelation from god the scriptures in which could be found all knowledge everything that man could need in the journey of life nothing outside of the inspired book except legends and prayers could be of any value books that contradicted the bible were hurtful those that agreed with it useless nothing was of importance except faith credulity belief 
the church said let philosophy alone count your beads ask no questions fall upon your knees shut your eyes and save your souls what has the church done for centuries it kept the earth flat for centuries it made all the hosts of heaven travel around this world for centuries it clung to sacred knowledge and fought facts with the ferocity of a fiend for centuries it hated the useful it was the deadly enemy of medicine disease was produced by devils and could be cured only by priests decaying bones and holy water doctors were the rivals of priests they diverted the revenue the church opposed the study of anatomy was against the dissection of the dead man had no right to cure a disease god would do that through his priests man had no right to prevent disease diseases were sent by god as judgments the church opposed inoculation vaccination and the use of chloroform and ether it was declared to be a sin a crime for a woman to lessen the pangs of motherhood the church declared that the woman must bear the curse of the merciful jehovah what has the church done it taught that the insane were inhabited by devils insanity was not a disease it was produced by demons it could be cured by prayers gifts amulets and charms all these had to be paid for this enriched the church these ideas were honestly entertained by protestants as well as catholics by luther calvin knox and wesley what has the church done it taught the awful doctrine of witchcraft it filled the darkness with demons the air with devils and the world with grief and shame it charged men women and children with being in league with satan to injure their fellows old women were convicted for causing storms at sea for preventing rain and for bringing frost girls were convicted for having changed themselves into wolves snakes and toads these witches were burned for causing diseases for selling their souls and for souring beer all these things were done with the aid of the devil who sought to persecute the faithful the lambs of god satan sought in many ways to scandalize the church he sometimes assumed the appearance of a priest and committed crimes on one occasion he personated a bishop a bishop renowned for his sanctity allowed himself to be discovered and dragged from the room of a beautiful widow so perfectly did he counterfeit the features and form of the bishop that many who were well acquainted with the prelate were actually deceived and the widow herself thought her lover was the bishop all this was done by the devil to bring reproach upon holy men hundreds of like instances could be given as the war waged between demons and priests was long and bitter these popes and priests these clergymen were not hypocrites they believed in the new testament in the teachings of christ and they knew that the principal business of the saviour was casting out devils what has the church done it made the wife a slave the property of the husband and it placed the husband as much above the wife as christ was above the husband it taught that a nun is purer nobler than a mother it induced millions of pure and conscientious girls to renounce the joys of life to take the veil woven of night and death to wear the habiliments of the dead made them believe that they were the brides of christ for my part i would as soon be a widow as the bride of a man who had been dead for eighteen hundred years the poor deluded girls imagined that they in some mysterious way were in spiritual wedlock united with god all worldly desires were driven from their hearts they filled their lives with fastings with prayers with self-accusings they forgot fathers and mothers and gave their love to the invisible they were the victims the convicts of superstition prisoners in the penitentiaries of god conscientious good sincere insane these loving women gave their hearts to a phantom their lives to a dream a few years ago at a revival a fine buxom girl was converted born again 
in her excitement she cried i'm married to christ i'm married to christ in her delirium she threw her arms around the neck of an old man and again cried i'm married to christ the old man who happened to be a kind of skeptic gently removed her hands saying at the same time i don't know much about your husband but i have great respect for your father-in-law priests theologians have taken advantage of women of their gentleness their love of approbation they have lived upon their hopes and fears like vampires they have sucked their blood they have made them responsible for the sins of the world they have taught them the slave virtues meekness humility implicit obedience they have fed their minds with mistakes mysteries and absurdities they have endeavored to weaken and shrivel their brains until to them there would be no possible connection between evidence and belief between fact and faith what has the church done it was the enemy of commerce of business it denounced the taking of interest for money without taking interest for money progress is impossible the steamships the great factories the railroads have all been built with borrowed money money on which interest was promised and for the most part paid the church was opposed to fire insurance to life insurance it denounced insurance in any form as gambling as immoral to insure your life was to declare that you had no confidence in god that you relied on a corporation instead of divine providence it was declared that god would provide for your widow and your fatherless children to insure your life was to insult heaven what has the church done the church regarded epidemics as messengers of the good god the black death was sent by the eternal father whose mercy spared some and whose justice murdered the rest to stop the scourge they tried to soften the heart of god by kneelings and prostrations by processions and prayers by burning incense and by making vows they did not try to remove the cause the cause was god they did not ask for pure water but for holy water faith and filth lived or rather died together religion and rags piety and pollution kept company sanctity kept its odor what has the church done it was the enemy of art and literature it destroyed the marvels of greece and rome beauty was pagan it destroyed so far as it could the best literature of the world it feared thought but it preserved the scriptures the ravings of insane saints the falsehoods of the fathers the bulls of popes the accounts of miracles performed by shrines by dried blood and faded hair by pieces of bones and wood by rusty nails and thorns by handkerchiefs and rags by water and beads and by the finger of the holy ghost this was the literature of the church i admit that the priests were honest as honest as ignorant more could not be said what has the church done christianity claims with great pride that it established asylums for the insane yes it did but the insane were treated as criminals they were regarded as the homes as the tenement houses of devils they were persecuted and tormented they were chained and flogged starved and killed the asylums were prisons dungeons the insane were victims and the keepers were ignorant conscientious pious fiends they were not trying to help men they were fighting devils destroying demons they were not actuated by love but by hate and fear what has the church done it founded schools where facts were denied where science was denounced and philosophy despised schools where priests were made where they were taught to hate reason and to look upon doubts as the suggestions of the devil schools where the heart was hardened and the brain shriveled schools in which lies were sacred and truths profane schools for the more general diffusion of ignorance schools to prevent thought to suppress knowledge schools for the purpose of enslaving the world schools in which teachers knew less than pupils what has the church done 
it has used its influence with god to get rain and sunshine to stop flood and storm to kill insects rats snakes and wild beasts to stay pestilence and famine to delay frost and snow to lengthen the lives of kings and queens to protect presidents to give legislators wisdom to increase collections and subscriptions in marriages it has made god the party of the third part it has sprinkled water on babes when they were named it has put oil on the dying and repeated prayers for the dead it has tried to protect the people from the malice of the devil from ghosts and spooks from witches and wizards and all the leering fiends that seek to poison the souls of men it has endeavored to protect the sheep of god from the wolves of science from the wild beasts of doubt and investigation it has tried to wean the lambs of the lord from the delights the pleasures the joys of life according to the philosophy of the church the virtuous weep and suffer the vicious laugh and thrive the good carry a cross and the wicked fly but in the next life this will be reversed then the good will be happy and the bad will be damned the church filled the world with faith and crime it polluted the fountains of joy it gave us an ignorant jealous revengeful and cruel god sometimes merciful sometimes ferocious now just now infamous sometimes wise generally foolish it gave us a devil cunning malicious almost the equal of god not quite as strong but quicker not as profound but sharper it gave us angels with wings cherubim and seraphim and a heaven with harps and hallelujahs with streets of gold and gates of pearl it gave us fiends and imps with wings like bats it gave us ghosts and goblins spooks and sprites and little devils that swarmed in the bodies of men and it gave us hell where the souls of men will roast in eternal flames shall we thank the church shall we thank the orthodox churches shall we thank them for the hell they made here shall we thank them for the hell of the future section two we must remember that the church was founded and has been protected by god and all the popes and cardinals all the bishops priests and monks all the ministers and exhorters were selected and set apart all sanctified and enlightened by the infinite god that the holy scriptures were inspired by the same being and that all the orthodox creeds were really made by him we know what these men filled with the holy ghost have done we know the part they have played we know the souls they have saved and the bodies they have destroyed we know the consolation they have given and the pain they have inflicted the lies they have defended the truths they have denied we know that they convinced millions that celibacy is the greatest of all virtues that women are perpetual temptations the enemies of true holiness that monks and priests are nobler than fathers that nuns are purer than mothers we know that they taught the blessed absurdity of the trinity that god once worked at the trade of a carpenter in palestine we know that they divided knowledge into sacred and profane taught that revelation was sacred that reason was blasphemous that faith was holy and facts false that the sin of adam and eve brought disease and pain vice and death into the world we know that they have taught the dogma of special providence that all events are ordered and regulated by god that he crowns and uncrowns kings preserves and destroys guards and kills that it is the duty of man to submit to the divine will and that no matter how much evil there may be no matter how much suffering how much pain and death man should pour out his heart in thankfulness that it is no worse let me be understood i do not say and i do not think that the church was dishonest that the clergy were insincere i admit that all religions all creeds all priests have been naturally produced i admit and cheerfully admit that the believers in the supernatural have done some good not because they believed in gods and devils but in spite of it i know that thousands and thousands of clergymen are honest self-denying and humane 
that they are doing what they believe to be their duty doing what they can to induce men and women to live pure and noble lives this is not the result of their creeds it is because they are human what i say is that every honest teacher of the supernatural has been and is an unconscious enemy of the human race what is the philosophy of the church of those who believe in the supernatural back of all that is back of all events christians put an infinite juggler who with a wish creates preserves destroys the world is his stage and mankind his puppets he fills them with wants and desires with appetites and ambitions with hopes and fears with love and hate he touches the springs he pulls the strings baits the hooks sets the traps and digs the pits the play is a continuous performance he watches these puppets as they struggle and fail sees them outwit each other and themselves leads them to every crime watches the births and deaths hears lullabies at cradles and the fall of clods on coffins he has no pity he enjoys the tragedies the desperation the despair the suicides he smiles at the murders the assassinations the seductions the desertions the abandoned babes of shame he sees the weak enslaved mothers robbed of babes the innocent in dungeons on scaffolds he sees crime crowned and hypocrisy robed he withholds the rain and his puppets starve he opens the earth and they are devoured he sends the flood and they are drowned he empties the volcano and they perish in fire he sends the cyclone and they are torn and mangled with quick lightnings they are dashed to death he fills the air and water with the invisible enemies of life the messengers of pain and watches the puppets as they breathe and drink he creates cancers to feed upon their flesh their quivering nerves serpents to fill their veins with venom beasts to crunch their bones to lap their blood some of the poor puppets he makes insane makes them struggle in the darkness with imagined monsters with glaring eyes and dripping jaws and some are made without the flame of thought to drool and drivel through the darkened days he sees all the agony the injustice the rags of poverty the withered hands of want the motherless babes the deformed the maimed the leprous knows the tears that flow hears the sobs and moans sees the gleam of swords hears the roar of the guns sees the fields reddened with blood the white faces of the dead but he mocks when their fear cometh and at their calamity he fills the heavens with laughter and the poor puppets who are left alive fall on their knees and thank the juggler with all their hearts but after all the gods have not supported the children of men men have supported the gods they have built the temples they have sacrificed their babes their lambs their cattle they have drenched the altars with blood they have given their silver their gold their gems they have fed and clothed their priests but the gods have given nothing in return hidden in the shadows they have answered no prayer heard no cry given no sign extended no hand uttered no word unseen and unheard they have sat on their thrones deaf and dumb paralyzed and blind in vain the steeples rise in vain the prayers ascend and think what man has done to please the gods he has renounced his reason extinguished the torch of his brain he has believed without evidence and against evidence he has slandered and maligned himself he has fasted and starved he has mutilated his body scarred his flesh given his blood to vermin he has persecuted imprisoned and destroyed his fellows he has deserted wife and child he has lived alone in the desert he has swung censers and burned incense counted beads and sprinkled himself with holy water shut his eyes clasped his hands fallen on his knees and groveled in the dust but the gods have been silent silent as stones have these cringings and crawlings these cruelties and absurdities this faith and foolishness pleased the gods we do not know 
has any disaster been averted any blessing obtained we do not know shall we thank these gods shall we thank the church's god who and what is he they say that he is the creator and the preserver of all that has been of all that is of all that will be that he is the father of angels and devils the architect of heaven and hell that he made the earth a man and woman that he made the serpent who tempted them made his own rival gave victory to his enemy that he repented of what he had done that he sent a flood and destroyed all of the children of men with the exception of eight persons that he tried to civilize the survivors and their children tried to do this with earthquakes and fiery serpents with pestilence and famine but he failed he intended to fail then he was born into the world preached for three years and allowed some savages to kill him then he rose from the dead and went back to heaven he knew that he would fail knew that he would be killed in fact he arranged everything himself and brought everything to pass just as he had predestined it an eternity before the world was all who believe these things will be saved and they who doubt or deny will be lost has this god good sense not always he creates his own enemies and plots against himself nothing lives except in accordance with his will and yet the devils do not die what is the matter with this god well sometimes he is foolish sometimes he is cruel and sometimes he is insane does this god exist is there any intelligence back of nature is there any being anywhere among the stars who pities the suffering children of men we do not know shall we thank nature does nature care for us more than for leaves or grass or flies does nature know that we exist we do not know but we do know that nature is going to murder us all why should we thank nature if we thank god or nature for the sunshine and rain for health and happiness whom shall we curse for famine and pestilence for earthquake and cyclone for disease and death this ends robert ingersoll's a thanksgiving sermon part one of two a thanksgiving sermon part two by robert g ingersoll this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana and now part two of a thanksgiving sermon section three if we cannot thank the orthodox churches if we cannot thank the unknown the incomprehensible the supernatural if we cannot thank nature if we cannot kneel to a guess or prostrate ourselves before a perhaps whom shall we thank let us see what the worldly have done what has been accomplished by those not called not set apart not inspired not filled with the holy ghost by those who were neglected by all the gods passing over the hindus the egyptians the greeks and romans their poets philosophers and metaphysicians we will come to modern times in the tenth century after christ the saracens governors of a vast empire established colleges in mongolia tartary persia mesopotamia syria egypt north africa morocco fez and in spain the region owned by the saracens was greater than the roman empire they had not only colleges but observatories the sciences were taught they introduced the ten numerals taught algebra and trigonometry understood cubic equations knew the art of surveying they made catalogues and maps of the stars gave the great stars the names they still bear they ascertained the size of the earth determined the obliquity of the ecliptic and fixed the length of the year 
they calculated eclipses equinoxes solstices conjunctions of planets and occultations of stars they constructed astronomical instruments they made clocks of various kinds and were the inventors of the pendulum they originated chemistry discovered sulfuric and nitric acid and alcohol they were the first to publish pharmacopias and dispensatories in mechanics they determined the laws of falling bodies they understood the mechanical powers and the attraction of gravitation they taught hydrostatics and determined the specific gravities of bodies in optics they discovered that a ray of light did not proceed from the eye to an object but from the object to the eye they were manufacturers of cotton leather paper and steel they gave us the game of chess they produced romances and novels and essays on many subjects in their schools they taught the modern doctrines of evolution and development they anticipated darwin and spencer these people were not christians they were the followers for the most part of an impostor of a pretended prophet of a false god and yet while the true christians the men selected by the true god and filled with the holy ghost were tearing out the tongues of heretics these wretches were irreverently tracing the orbits of the stars while the true believers were flaying philosophers and extinguishing the eyes of thinkers these godless followers of mohammed were founding colleges collecting manuscripts investigating the facts of nature and giving their attention to science afterward the followers of mohammed became the enemies of science and hated facts as intensely and honestly as christians whoever has a revelation from god will defend it with all his strength will abhor reason and deny facts but it is as well to know that we are indebted to the moors to the followers of mohammed for having laid the foundations of modern science it is well to know that we are not indebted to the church to christianity for any useful fact it is well to know that the seeds of thought were sown in our minds by the greeks and romans and that our literature came from those seeds the great literature of our language is pagan in its thought pagan in its beauty pagan in its perfection it is well to know that when mohammedans were the friends of science christians were its enemies how consoling it is to think that the friends of science the men who educated their fellows are now in hell and that the men who persecuted and killed philosophers are now in heaven such is the justice of god the christians of the middle ages the men who were filled with the holy ghost knew all about the worlds beyond the grave but nothing about the world in which they lived they thought the earth was flat a little dishing if anything that it was about five thousand years old and that the stars were little sparkles made to beautify the night the fact is that christianity was in existence for fifteen hundred years before there was an astronomer in christendom no follower of christ knew the shape of the earth the earth was demonstrated to be a globe not by a pope or a cardinal not by a collection of clergymen not by the called or the set apart but by a sailor magellan left seville spain august tenth fifteen nineteen sailed west and kept sailing west and the ship reached seville the port it left on september seventh fifteen twenty two the world had been circumnavigated the earth was known to be round there had been a dispute between the scriptures and a sailor the fact took the sailor's side in 1543 copernicus published his book on the revolutions of the heavenly bodies he had some idea of the vastness of the stars of the astronomical spaces of the insignificance of this world toward the close of the sixteenth century bruno one of the greatest men this world has produced gave his thoughts to his fellow men he taught the plurality of worlds he was a pantheist an atheist an honest man he called the catholic church the triumphant beast he was imprisoned for many years tried convicted and on the sixteenth day of february sixteen hundred burned in rome by men filled with the holy ghost 
burned on the spot where now his monument rises bruno the noblest the greatest of all the martyrs the only one who suffered death for what he believed to be the truth the only martyr who had no heaven to gain no hell to shun no god to please he was nobler than inspired men grander than prophets greater and purer than apostles above all the theologians of the world above the makers of creeds above the founders of religions rose this serene unselfish and intrepid man yet christians followers of christ murdered this incomparable man these christians were true to their creed they believed that faith would be rewarded with eternal joy and doubt punished with eternal pain they were logical they were pious and pitiless devout and devilish meek and malicious religious and revengeful christ-like and cruel loving with their mouths and hating with their hearts and yet honest victims of ignorance and fear what have the worldly done in 1608, Lippershey, a Hollander, so arranged lenses that objects were exaggerated. He invented the telescope. He gave countless worlds to our eyes and made us citizens of the universe. In 1610, on the night of January 7th, Galileo demonstrated the truth of the Copernican system and in 1632 published his work on the system of the world. What did the church do? galileo was arrested imprisoned forced to fall upon his knees put his hand on the bible and recant for ten years he was kept in prison for ten years until released by the pity of death then the church men filled with the holy ghost denied his body burial in consecrated ground it was feared that his dust might corrupt the bodies of those who had persecuted him in 1609, Kepler published his book, Motions of the Planet Mars. He, too, knew of the attraction of gravitation and that it acted in proportion to mass and distance. Kepler announced his three laws. He found and mathematically expressed the relation of distance, mass, and motion. Nothing greater has been accomplished by the human mind. Astronomy became a science and Christianity a superstition. Then came Newton, Herschel, and Laplace. The astronomy of Joshua and Elijah faded from the minds of intelligent men, and Jehovah became an ignorant tribal god. Men began to see that the operations of nature were not subject to interference, that eclipses were not caused by the wrath of God, that comets had nothing to do with the destruction of empires or the death of kings that the stars wheeled in their orbits without regard to the actions of men. In the sacred east, the dawn appeared. What have the worldly done? A few years ago, a few men became wicked enough to use their senses. They began to look and listen. They began to really see, and then they began to reason. They forgot heaven and hell long enough to take some interest in this world. They began to examine soils and rocks. They noticed what had been done by rivers and seas. They found out something about the crust of the earth. They found that most of the rocks had been deposited and stratified in the water, rocks 70,000 feet in thickness. They found that the coal was once vegetable matter. They made the best calculations they could of the time required to make the coal and concluded that it must have taken at least six or seven millions of years. They examined the chalk cliffs, found that they were composed of the microscopic shells of minute organisms, that is to say, the dust of these shells. This dust settled over areas as large as Europe, and in some places the chalk is a mile in depth. This must have required many millions of years. Lyell, the highest authority on the subject, says that it must have required, to cause the changes that we know, at least 200 million years. Think of these vast deposits caused by the slow falling of infinitesimal atoms of impalpable dust through the silent depths of ancient seas. 
think of the microscopic forms of life constructing their minute houses of lime giving life to others leaving their mansions beneath the waves and so through countless generations building the foundations of continents and islands go back of all life that we now know back of all the flying lizards the armored monsters the hissing serpents the winged and fanged horrors back to the laurentian rocks to the eozoon the first of living things that we have found back of all mountains seas and rivers back to the first incrustation of the molten world back of wave of fire and robe of flame back to the time when all the substance of the earth blazed in the glowing sun with all the stars that wheel about the central fire think of the days and nights that lie between think of the centuries the withered leaves of time that strew the desert of the past nature does not hurry time cannot be wasted cannot be lost the future remains eternal and all the past is as though it had not been as though it were to be the infinite knows neither gain nor loss we know something of the history of the world something of the human race and we know that man has lived and struggled through want and war through pestilence and famine through ignorance and crime through fear and hope on the old earth for millions and millions of years at last we know that infallible popes and countless priests and clergymen who had been called filled with the holy ghost and presidents of colleges kings emperors and executives of nations had mistaken the blundering guesses of ignorant savages for the wisdom of an infinite god at last we know that the story of creation of the beginning of things as told in the sacred book is not only untrue but utterly absurd and idiotic now we know that the inspired writers did not know and that the god who inspired them did not know we are no longer misled by myths and legends we rely upon facts the world is our witness and the stars testify for us what have the worldly done they have investigated the religions of the world have read the sacred books the prophecies the commandments the rules of conduct they have studied the symbols the ceremonies the prayers and sacrifices and they have shown that all religions are substantially the same produced by the same causes that all rest on a misconception of the facts in nature that all are founded on ignorance and fear on mistake and mystery they have found that christianity is like the rest that it was not a revelation but a natural growth that its gods and devils its heavens and hells were borrowed that its ceremonies and sacraments were souvenirs of other religions that no part of it came from heaven but that it was all made by savage man they found that jehovah was a tribal god and that his ancestors had lived on the banks of the euphrates the tigris the ganges and the nile and these ancestors were traced back to still more savage forms they found that all the sacred books were filled with inspired mistake and sacred absurdity but say the christians we have the only inspired book we have the old testament and the new where did you get the old testament from the jews yes let me tell you about it after the jews returned from babylon about four hundred years before christ ezra commenced making the bible you will find an account of this in the bible we know that genesis was written after the captivity because it was from the babylonians that the jews got the story of creation of adam and eve of the garden of the serpent and the tree of life of the flood and from them they learned about the sabbath you find nothing about that holy day in judges joshua samuel kings or chronicles nothing in job the psalms in esther solomon's song or ecclesiastes only in books written by ezra after the return from babylon when ezra finished the inspired book he placed it in the temple it was written on the skins of beasts and so far as we know there was but one what became of this bible jerusalem was taken by titus about seventy years after christ 
the temple was destroyed and at the request of josephus the holy bible was sent to vespasian the emperor at rome and this holy bible has never been seen or heard of since so much for that then there was a copy or rather a translation called the septuagint how was that made it is said that ptolemy sauter and his son ptolemy philadelphus obtained a translation of the jewish bible this translation was made by seventy persons at that time the jewish bible did not contain daniel ecclesiastes but few of the psalms and only a part of isaiah what became of this translation known as the septuagint it was burned in the Bruchium Library forty-seven years before Christ. Then there was another so-called copy of part of the Bible known as the Samaritan Roll of the Pentateuch. But this was not considered of any value. Have we a true copy of the Bible that was in the temple at Jerusalem, the one sent to Vespasian? Nobody knows. Have we a true copy of the Septuagint? Nobody knows. What is the oldest manuscript of the Bible we have in Hebrew? The oldest manuscript we have in Hebrew was written in the 10th century after Christ. The oldest pretended copy we have of the Septuagint, written in Greek, was made in the 5th century after Christ. If the Bible was divinely inspired, if it was the actual word of God, we have no authenticated copy. The original has been lost, and we are left in the darkness of nature. It is impossible for us to show that our Bible is correct. We have no standard. Many of the books in our Bible contradict each other. Many chapters appear to be incomplete, and parts of different books are written in the same words, showing that both could not have been original. The 19th and 20th chapters of Second Kings and the 37th and 38th chapters of Isaiah are exactly the same. So is the 36th chapter of Isaiah from the second verse the same as the 18th chapter of Second Kings from the second verse. So it is perfectly apparent that there could have been no possible propriety in inspiring the writers of Kings and the writers of Chronicles. The books are substantially the same, differing in a few mistakes, in a few falsehoods. The same is true of Leviticus and Numbers. The books do not agree either in facts or philosophy. They differ as the men differed who wrote them. What have the worldly done? They have investigated the phenomena of nature. They have invented ways to use the forces of the world, the weight of falling water, of moving air. They have changed water to steam, invented engines, the tireless giants that work for a man. They have made lightning a messenger and slave. They invented movable type, taught us the art of printing, and made it possible to save and transmit the intellectual wealth of the world. They connected continents with cables, cities and towns with the telegraph, brought the world into one family, made intelligence independent of distance. They taught us how to build homes, to obtain food, to weave cloth. They covered the seas with iron ships and the land with roads and steeds of steel. They gave us the tools of all the trades, the implements of labor. They chiseled statues, painted pictures, and witched the world with form and color. They have found the cause of and the cure of many maladies that afflict the flesh and minds of men. They have given us instruments of music, and the great composers and performers have changed the common air to tones and harmonies that intoxicate, exalt, and purify the soul. They have rescued us from the prisons of fear and snatched our souls from the fangs and claws of superstition's loathsome, crawling, flying beasts. They have given us the liberty to think and the courage to express our thoughts. They have changed the frightened, the enslaved, the kneeling, the prostrate into men and women, clothed them in their right minds and made them truly free. They have uncrowned the phantoms, wrested the scepters from the ghosts, and given this world to the children of men. They have driven from the heart the fiends of fear and extinguished the flames of hell. 
they have read a few leaves of the great volume deciphered some of the records written on stone by the tireless hands of time in the dim past they have told us something of what has been done by wind and wave by fire and frost by life and death the ceaseless workers the pauseless forces of the world they have enlarged the horizon of the known changed the glittering specks that shine above us to wheeling worlds and filled all spaces with countless suns they have found the qualities of substance the nature of things how to analyze separate and combine and have enabled us to use the good and avoid the hurtful they have given us mathematics in the higher forms by means of which we measure the astronomical spaces the distances to stars the velocity at which the heavenly bodies move their density and weight and by which the mariner navigates the waste and trackless seas they have given us all we have of knowledge of literature and art they have made life worth living they have filled the world with conveniences comforts and luxuries all this has been done by the worldly by those who were not called or set apart or filled with the holy ghost or had the slightest claim to apostolic succession the men who accomplished these things were not inspired they had no revelation no supernatural aid they were not clad in sacred vestments and tiaras were not upon their brows they were not even ordained they used their senses observed and recorded facts they had confidence in reason they were patient searchers for the truth they turned their attention to the affairs of this world they were not saints they were sensible men they worked for themselves for wife and child and for the benefit of all to these men we are indebted for all we are for all we know for all we have they were the creators of civilization the founders of free states the saviors of liberty the destroyers of superstition and the great captains in the army of progress section four whom shall we thank standing here at the close of the nineteenth century amid the trophies of thought the triumphs of genius here under the flag of the great republic knowing something of the history of man here on this day that has been set apart for thanksgiving i most reverently thank the good men the good women of the past i thank the kind fathers the loving mothers of the savage days i thank the father who spoke the first gentle word the mother who first smiled upon her babe i thank the first true friend i thank the savages who hunted and fished that they and their babes might live i thank those who cultivated the ground and changed the forests into farms those who built rude homes and watched the faces of their happy children in the glow of fireside flames those who domesticated horses cattle and sheep those who invented wheels and looms and taught us to spin and weave those who by cultivation changed wild grasses into wheat and corn changed bitter things to fruit and worthless weeds to flowers that sowed within our souls the seeds of art i thank the poets of the dawn the tellers of legends the makers of myths the singers of joy and grief of hope and love i thank the artists who chiseled forms in stone and who wrought with light and shade the face of man i thank the philosophers the thinkers who taught us how to use our minds in the great search for truth i thank the astronomers who explored the heavens told us the secrets of the stars the glories of the constellations the geologists who found the story of the world in fossil forms in memoranda kept in ancient rocks in lines written by waves by frost and fire the anatomists who sought in muscle nerve and bone for all the mysteries of life the chemists who unraveled nature's work that they might learn her art the physicians who have laid the hand of science on the brow of pain the hand whose magic touch restores the surgeons who have defeated nature's self and forced her to preserve the lives of those she labored to destroy i thank the discoverers of chloroform and ether the two angels who give to their beloved sleep and wrap the throbbing brain in soft robes of dreams 
i thank the great inventors those who gave us movable type and the press by means of which the thoughts of all discovered facts are made immortal the inventors of engines of the great ships of the railways the cables and telegraphs i thank the great mechanics the workers in iron and steel in wood and stone i thank the inventors and makers of the numberless things of use and luxury i thank the industrious men the loving mothers the useful women they are the benefactors of our race the inventor of pins did a thousand times more good than all the popes and cardinals bishops and priests than all the clergymen and parsons exhorters and theologians that ever lived the inventor of matches did more for the comfort and convenience of mankind than all the founders of religions and the makers of all creeds than all malicious monks and selfish saints i thank the honest men and women who have expressed their sincere thoughts who have been true to themselves and have preserved the veracity of their souls i thank the thinkers of greece and rome zeno and epicurus cicero and lucretius i thank bruno the bravest and spinoza the subtlest of men i thank voltaire whose thought lighted a flame in the brain of man unlocked the doors of superstition's cells and gave liberty to many millions of his fellow-men voltaire a name that sheds light voltaire a star that superstition's darkness cannot quench i thank the great poets the dramatists i thank homer and aeschylus and i thank shakespeare above them all i thank burns for the heart throbs he changed into songs for his lyrics of flame i thank shelley for his skylark keats for his grecian urn and byron for his prisoner of chillon i thank the great novelists i thank the great sculptors i thank the unknown man who moulded and chiselled the venus de milo i thank the great painters i thank rembrandt and corot i thank all who have adorned enriched and ennobled life all who have created the great the noble the heroic and artistic ideals i thank the statesmen who have preserved the rights of man i thank thomas paine whose genius sowed the seeds of independence in the hearts of seventeen seventy six i thank thomas jefferson whose mighty words for liberty have made the circuit of the globe i thank the founders the defenders the saviors of the republic i thank john erickson the greatest mechanic of his century for the monitor i thank lincoln for the proclamation i thank grant for his victories and the vast host that fought for the right for the freedom of man i thank them all the living and the dead i thank the great scientists those who have reached the foundation the bedrock who have built upon facts the great scientists in whose presence theologians look silly and feel malicious the scientists never persecuted never imprisoned their fellow-men they forged no chains built no dungeons erected no scaffolds tore no flesh with red-hot pinchers dislocated no joints on racks crushed no bones in iron boots extinguished no eyes tore out no tongues and lighted no faggots they did not pretend to be inspired they did not claim to be prophets or saints or to have been born again they were only intelligent and honest men they did not appeal to force or fear they did not regard men as slaves to be ruled by torture by lash and chain nor as children to be cheated with illusions rocked in the cradle of an idiot creed and soothed by a lullaby of lies they did not wound they healed they did not kill they lengthened life they did not enslave they broke the chains and made men free they sowed the seeds of knowledge and many millions have reaped are reaping and will reap the harvest of joy i thank humboldt and helmholst and Heckel and buchner i thank lamarck and darwin darwin who revolutionized the thought of the intellectual world i thank huxley and spencer i thank the scientists one and all 
i thank the heroes the destroyers of prejudice and fear the dethroners of savage gods the extinguishers of hate's eternal fire the heroes the breakers of chains the founders of free states the makers of just laws the heroes who fought and fell on countless fields the heroes whose dungeons became shrines the heroes whose blood made scaffolds sacred the heroes the apostles of reason the disciples of truth the soldiers of freedom the heroes who held high the holy torch and filled the world with light with all my heart i thank them all this ends the thanksgiving sermon part two by robert g ingersoll read for you by michelle fry in november two thousand seventeen an extract from the training of a sovereign by queen victoria this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org thursday 17th of march we reached windsor castle at 6 we went to the queen's room where ferdinand and augustus were presented to the king we then went to our rooms at half past seven we dined in st george's hall with an immense number of people ferdinand looked very well he wore the free portuguese orders in one ribbon which he is the right of doing as husband to the queen of portugal ferdinand led the queen in to dinner and the king led mamma and i i sat between the king and george cambridge and opposite dear ferdinand after dinner we went into a beautiful new drawing-room where we remained till the gentlemen came from dinner. We then all went into the Waterloo Gallery, where the ball was. The King went in first, then the Queen and Mamma, and then dear Ferdinand with me at his arm. I danced three quadrilles, first with dear Ferdinand, then with George Cambridge, and lastly with dear Augustus. During the evening, dear Ferdinand came and sat near me and talked so dearly and so sensibly. I do so love him. Dear Augustus also sat near me and talked with me, and he is also a dear, good young man and is very handsome. He is extremely quiet and silent, but there is a great deal in him. I am so fond, too, of my Uncle Ferdinand. I stayed up till one i was much amused and pleased uncle ferdinand brought me two kind notes from uncle leopold and aunt louise ferdinand is so fond of aunt louise he told me oh je l'aime tante both he and augustus speak french extremely well this dinner and ball were in honour of dear ferdinand wednesday eighteenth of may at a quarter to two we went down into the hall to receive my uncle Ernest, Duke of saxe coburg Gotha, and my cousins, Ernest and Albert, his sons. My uncle was here, now five years ago, and is looking extremely well. Ernest is as tall as Ferdinand and Augustus. He has dark hair and fine dark eyes and eyebrows, but the nose and mouth are not good. He has a most kind, honest and intelligent expression in his countenance and has a very good figure. Albert, who is just as tall as Ernest but stouter, is extremely handsome. His hair is about the same colour as mine. His eyes are large and blue, and he has a beautiful nose and a very sweet mouth with fine teeth. But the charm of his countenance is in his expression, which is most delightful. C'est à la joie, full of goodness and sweetness, and very clever and intelligent we went upstairs with them and after staying a few minutes with them i went up to my room played and sang drew at a little after four uncle ernest and my cousins came up to us and stayed in my room till ten minutes past five both my cousins are so kind and good they are much more formé and men of the world than augustus they speak English very well, and I speak it with them. 
Ernest will be 18 years old on the 21st of June and Albert 17 on the 26th of August. Dear Uncle Ernest may be in the presence of a most delightful lorry, which is so tame that it remains on your hand and you may put your finger into its beak or do anything with it without its ever attempting to bite. Saturday, 21st of May. At half past seven, we dined with Uncle Ernest, Ernest, Albert, Charles, Lady Flora, Count Colorat, Baron Alvisben, and company. I sat between my dear cousins. After dinner came Princess Sophia, Baron de Hoggier, who had arrived from Lisbon the day before, came after dinner and took leave on his way home. I sat between my dear cousins on the sofa and we looked at drawings. They both draw very well, particularly Albert, and are both exceedingly fond of music, and they play very nicely on the piano. The more I see them, the more I am delighted with them, and the more I love them. They are so natural, so kind, so very good, and so well instructed and informed. They are so well bred, so truly merry, and quite like children, and yet very grown up in their manners and conversation. It is delightful to be with them. They are so fond of being occupied too. They are quite an example for any young person. Friday, 10th of June. At nine, we all breakfasted for the last time together. It was our last happy, happy breakfast with this dear uncle and those dearest beloved cousins whom I do so love very, very dearly, much more dearly than any other cousins in the world dearly as i love ferdinand and also good augustus i love ernest and albert more than them oh yes much more augustus was like a good affectionate child quite unacquainted with the world phlegmatic and talking but very little but dearest ernest and dearest albert are so grown up in their manners so gentle so kind so amiable so agreeable so very sensible and reasonable, and so really and truly good and kind-hearted. They have both learnt a good deal, and are very clever, naturally clever, particularly Albert, who is the most reflecting of the two, and they like very much talking about the serious and instructive things, and yet they are so very, very merry and gay and happy, like young people ought to be. Albert always used to have some fun and some clever witty answer at breakfast and everywhere. He used to play and fondle Dash so funnily too. Both he and Ernest are extremely attentive to whatever they hear and see, and take an interest in everything they see. They were much interested with the sight of St Paul's yesterday. At eleven, dear uncle, my dearest beloved cousins, and Charles left us, accompanied by Count Colorat. I embrace both my dearest cousins most warmly and also my dear uncle. I cried bitterly, very bitterly. End of an extract from The Training of a Sovereign by Queen Victoria Read for LibriVox.org by Melanie T. History of Plymouth Plantation, 1620-1647, by William Bradford, published by Houghton Mifflin Company, 1912, page 149. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melvin Lee. Of their voyage, and how they passed the sea, and their safe arrival at Cape Cod. September 6. These troubles being blown over, and now all being compact together in one ship, they put to sea again, with a prosperous wind, which continued diverse days together, which was some encouragement unto them, yet, according to the usual manner, many were afflicted with sea-sickness. And I may not omit here a special work of God's providence, there was a proud and very profane young man, one of the seamen of a lusty, able body, which made him the more haughty. He would always be contemning the poor people in their sickness, 
and cursing them daily with grievous exertions, and did not let to tell them that he hoped to help to cast half of them overboard before they came to their journey's end, and to make merry with what they had, and if he were by any gently reproved, he would curse and swear most bitterly. But it pleased God before they came half seas over, to smite this young man with a grievous disease, of which he died in a desperate manner, and so was himself the first that was thrown overboard. Thus his curses light on his own head, and it was an astonishment to all his fellows, for they noted it to be the just hand of God upon him. After they had enjoyed fair winds and weather for a season, they were encountered many times with cross winds, and met with many fierce storms, with which the ship was shroudly shaken, and her upper works were made very leaky, and one of the main beams in the midships was bowed and cracked, which put them in some fear that the ship could not be able to perform the voyage. So some of the chief of the company, perceiving the mariners to fear the sufficiency of the ship, as appeared by their mutterings, they entered into serious consultation with the master and other officers of the ship, to consider in time of danger, and rather to return than to cast themselves into a desperate and inevitable peril. And truly there was great distraction, and difference of opinion amongst the mariners themselves. Fain would they do what could be done for their wages' sake, being now half the seas over, and on the other hand they were loath to hazard their lives so desperately. But in examining of all opinions, the master and others affirmed they knew the ship to be strong and firm under water, and, for the buckling of the main beam, there was a great iron screw the passengers brought out of Holland, which would raise the beam into his place. The which being done, the carpenter and master affirmed that, with a post put under it, set firm in the lower deck, and otherwise bound, he would make it sufficient. And as for the decks and upper works, they would caulk them as well as they could, and though with the working of the ship they would not long keep staunch, yet there would otherwise be no great danger if they did not overpress her with sails. So they committed themselves to the will of God and resolved to proceed. In sundry of these storms, the winds were so fierce and the seas so high as they could not bear a knot of sail, but were forced to hull for divers days together. And in one of them, as they thus lay at hull, in a mighty storm, a lusty young man called John Howland, coming upon some occasion above the gratings, was with a seal of the ship thrown into the sea, but it pleased God that he caught hold of the topsail halyards which hung overboard, and ran out at length. Yet he held his hold, though he was sundry fathoms under water, till he was hauled up by the same rope to the brim of the water, and then with a boat hook and other means got into the ship again, and his life saved and though he was something ill with it, yet he lived many years after, and became a profitable member both in church and commonwealth. In all this voyage there died but one of their passengers, which was William Button, a youth, servant to Samuel Fuller, when they drew near the coast. But to omit other things, that I may be brief, after long beating at sea, they fell with that land which is called Cape Cod, the which being made, and certainly known to be it, they were not a little joyful. After some deliberation had amongst themselves, and with the master of the ship, they tacked about and resolved to stand for the southward, the wind and weather being fair, to find some place about Hudson's River for their habitation. But after they had sailed that course about half the day, they fell amongst dangerous shoals and roaring breakers, and they were so far entangled therewith as they conceived themselves in great danger. 
and the wind shrinking upon them withal, they resolved to bear up again for the cape, and thought themselves happy to get out of those dangers before night overtook them, as by God's good providence they did. And the next day they got into the Cape Harbor, where they rid with safety. A word or two by the way of this Cape. It was thus first named by Captain Gosnell and his company, Anno 1602, and after by Captain Smith was called Cape James, but it retains the former name amongst seamen, also that point which first showed those dangerous shoals unto them they called Point Care, and Tucker's Terror, but the French and Dutch to this day call it Malabar, by reason of those perilous shoals and the losses they have suffered there. Being thus arrived in a good harbor, and brought safe to land, they fell upon their knees and blessed the God of heaven, who had brought them over the vast and furious ocean, and delivered them from all the perils and miseries thereof, again to set their feet on the firm and stable earth, their proper element. End of History of Plymouth Plantation by William Bradford